Time to take a ride on the Steelers Afternoon Drive with our co-hosts, Alan Saunders and Zachary Smith. Welcome back to another episode of Steelers Afternoon Drive. I'm Zachary Smith. That is Alan Saunders. No Hawaii sunrise, no palm trees in the background for either of us. Not in the pool still. Alan, how are we doing? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. It's been a low-key week here. So uh work has been has been low stress. So that's good. just working on that those articles recapping uh Kevin Colbert's last few draft classes, huh? It, it's it's been a slog. It's been a slog. I think I maybe bit off more than I can chew, but I'm gonna try to get it done here uh uh today and tomorrow. There we go. Okay, so be on the lookout for that. Of course, before we dive into anything, like subscribe, hit that notification bell, do all that good stuff on YouTube over here. Uh Alan. We asked for some questions yesterday. We didn't get through all those questions yesterday with Nick on here. Nick was just, you know, mouth was going miles per minute talking about Hawaii. We didn't get to all the questions that we would have hoped, but that's good because now we have them left over for today with it not being so newsy at this time of year. So we will dive into those uh, and a couple other things that will probably come about as we are talking here. Patrick wants to know about Darno Washington. Uh, he brought up his 40 time and 10 yard split being pretty good in his, his uh, shuttle time. Also elite. Why isn't he a bigger receiving threat? Yeah, I think it's an interesting question because, you know, I've seen Darnell Washington on the practice field for about a year now, and I look at those 40 times, mm-hmm. and, I, like, I don't see that athlete showing up in practice. Um, I think the 10-yard split, like, 4.64 is not like it's, like, ungodly fast. Um, mm-hmm. But, like, that's faster than Gronk. And it just for whatever reason, I do not see for the first thing that I will tell you is that you do not generally ask your six foot eight tight end to run 40 yards in a straight line. And his route running and like his his precision in his steps, even if he might be like fast in the first 10 yards going straight, uh, the route running to me is the big thing that holds him back. Is that he is just not a very good route runner. Um, right now certainly something he can work on and improve Um, I don't think the scheme helped him either last year we've talked about that before too like I I don't feel really felt like they I think it's two things right I think he's probably still pretty limited physically just he's not that good of a route runner he's not that quick in and out of his breaks Um, you know maybe compared to like the average tight end who had run a 40 that fast even Mm -hmm. though he did and he had a good shuttle time too it was just, you know, I, I think it's it's more about the precision of his route running than anything in terms of why the physical traits haven't carried over. I also think the scheme did not really do a very good job of maximizing the things that he is able to do. Um, you know, 10, 10 to broad, 31 vertical, like, you know, he's huge. And so is the long, largest wingspan ever among all tight ends. So I think they've got to find a better way to use him in terms of what he can do. But I, I, I don't think the athleticism tells the whole story in terms of like what the Steelers were getting um, when they drafted him. You know, it's not like they were drafting this guy who was this like big athletic freak that they were going to use as like a receiving tight end. Um, and and you know, Georgia didn't really use him like that either. You know, I mean, he did not have big college numbers as, as a receiving tight end. He had 28 catches for 454 yards in his junior season in 2022. That was his best year. That's, you know, that's, that's nothing too spectacular. Should he have more than seven for 61 that he had last year? Yeah, I think so. But, Hmm. you know, I, I think the, you know, in the NFL, if you can't run around, if you can't get open, even if you're gigantic, all you're going to do is catch the ball and get tackled. Um, you know, there's there's more to it than that, and I think he's still developing in the, in the route running terms as an area where he can get a lot better. I'm glad that you brought up the the footsteps because I feel like there is like a lot of wasted motion there with him. Like, a, I don't know if clunky is the way that I would describe it. Maybe it is. That's, that's pretty but fair. But yeah, like it just seems like there's a lot of. Uh, 
again, I get it because of his size and stuff, but that is to me the biggest detriment to him and why you maybe look at why those numbers, the testing numbers don't translate when you're talking about going onto the field. I mean, his mock draftable, you look at some of the comparable tight ends. You brought up Rob Gronkowski right there, fourth most comparable, 68% uh, compared to him. We've talked a lot about Theo Johnson during the draft period out of Penn State, right there as well, 68%. Kyle Pitts, 67%. Uh, Logan Thomas is the most common player to him in 70%. But everything with his measurable here, other than his vertical jump was average at 59% his bench press, which actually I'm surprised he only got 21 of those in 59 percentile for the position. Everything else was like stupid, like 78% or higher percentile for the position. So sure, the measurables are all there, but that doesn't necessarily mean they're going to translate in the way that you'd think. Yeah. Yeah. You got to be able to put them down in the right order and in the right way. And I'm not sure that's happening yet. Um, I think, I wouldn't give up on it happening because I do think that's something that you can improve on. I mean, it's better than the, you know, it's better than, you know, Zach Gentry where like, Oh, he's just not very fast. Like, uh, you know, you're not going to make a 24 year old appreciably faster, right? You can work on footwork Mm -hmm. and and timing and, you know, uh, eliminating wasted movements and things like that. So I think, I don't think the Steelers, were under like a false impression about what they were getting in Darnell Washington either. Like, I I don't think, yeah, I don't think they thought that, that, that he was going to be different than he's been. Um, also, I, I just think bigger, longer athletes take longer to mature and to adjust to the level than like shorter, faster guys. You know, I think when you think about, obviously like you have guys that are just like incredible athletic freaks, but when you talk about guys that are maybe like sort of like second tier caliber players, guys are drafting like the third, fourth, fifth round. I think the mm-hmm. ones that have immediate impacts are guys like Puka Nakua, right? Like an undersized guy that has already sort of maximized his athletic ability. And now he can just keep doing what he was doing in college in the NFL. When you're drafting guys that are more like projectable, right? Where it's like, oh, we're drafting him because of his size and his speed, not necessarily because of his body of work and his skill set. Then, I, you know, I think it's going to take a while for those things to show up if if they ever show up. You know, I remember like, you know, this, is, this is years ago, but a guy like David Boston, was a wide receiver out of Ohio State for Arizona, and he was just this dude that looked like you look at him, you're like, he looks like freaking Megatron out there. Like, hey, he's just this gigantic dude, like so strong, so fast. How is he not the best wide receiver in football? Like, he's so much bigger and stronger and faster than everybody else. And I mean, he eventually turned into a pretty good player, but it probably took until about his third year before he really made an impact. And I, I think. Like that's that's sometimes the way it goes when when you have those like oh this is a big strong fast guy we drafted on tools not on now ability. Yeah, I I will say too like even if that bag doesn't diversify for him, uh, I I still feel like there's so like not maybe so much more but a a good bit more to tap into that they didn't do last year. Like you mentioned, just take advantage of the size. Like that dude is going to draw DPIs. Uh, if you give him the opportunities to do so from time to time, just throw it up there when he gets those mismatches in the red zone. Certainly like those opportunities, they just, you know, last year they weren't there at all. So I, I'm curious to see what now Arthur Smith decides to do with him in this offense, because even if you're not using him between the twenties, all that much as a receiver, and that's really where he is a blocker, man, when you get into the red zone goal line situations, I think you got to have him be a factor for this offense. Yeah. like. You know, short yardage. I, I want him out there. I think they're going to play a ton of twelve personnel. I think he's going to play an awful lot yeah. this year. So, and and I think you know, I think he improved as the year went on his blocking too. Like that's the other thing, man. I honestly, if I'm like I, I in the first half of the year he wasn't catching the ball, and I, I, I was more concerned about his blocking. Like he, he, he has to block to be an NFL player. Yeah. He does not have to catch more than he has. If he could, if he just blocks the way he did in the second half of the year, he'll stick around for a long time. 
Yeah, absolutely. There's certainly a role for that uh, that he can carve out. Um, we spent uh, an episode last week with Derek on here talking about the future of the defensive line and talking about Keanu Benton's 2024 and how important he is, not just for that 2024, but going forward. Uh, Mo says, do you think the Steelers will sign one more defensive line uh, or add more depth before the season starts with Ogan Joby's history of injuries and Cam Hay- Hayward up there in age? Uh, I think they might have liked to, but there is nobody out there. I mean, nobody. Um, yeah. There, I mean, if you go look at like PFF's uh, you know, pre-free agency listing um, of the top available free, you know, all the top available free agents every position, the only defensive yeah. tackles left are Brian Moan from Seattle, who... I don't know. He's, you know, he's, he's not a sexy player. He he would fit in sort of with the the group of kind of randoms that they've got there with like the Dean Lowry's and the, and the mm-hmm. uh, uh, you know Montrevious Adams is of the world. Uh, he certainly can play a little, uh, probably a little bit better pass rusher than maybe some of those. But he's nothing like really moving the needle. And Fletcher Cox who's decided that he's retiring. That's it. Yeah. That That's there's nobody else. So no, I don't think the Steelers are going to sign a defensive tackle that moves the needle. Cause there isn't one out there. Um, and, and I think, I think they've kind of just resigned themselves to their depth being what their depth is at that position for this year. You can't fix everything every off season. Um, you know, they didn't lose that much from last year. They, you know, dropped down from, Armin Watts to Dean Lowry. I don't know how far of a drop that is, to be perfectly honest. Like I, I, I kind of like Dean Lowry. Uh, probably less, less of a pass rusher. They draft Logan Lee, give them another shot at a young guy catching fire. But I think, yeah, I, I think they kind of just have decided that they've got what they've got. Yeah, we mentioned that there's like an interesting battle at the bottom of that depth chart too. Like, I, I, are they going to bring in another body and push two of those guys off of the roster? In you know, DeMarvin Leal, Isaiah Loudermilk, um, Logan Lee, obviously, who you have on the outside. Like, I, I don't know. I mean, I could probably go through here and find the guy, like, especially inside pass rusher, because that's what they lost in Armin Watts from a reserve standpoint. Um, but probably not one that's like super intriguing. And again, are you going to do that as opposed to just hoping for another leap from one of your young players into DeMarvin Leal or Isaiah Loudermilk? I don't think there's anybody that's available that intrigues me as a pass rusher more than DeMarvin Leal does. Like, yeah. I, like that, like to me, like he, he's, he's the guy that's at like Hassan Ridgeway, uh, Linval Joseph, 37 year old Al Woods mm-hmm. who never ever rushed the passer. Chris Wormley coming back again. Like, I, I don't know. There's nobody, there's nobody out there that, that is even kind of remotely right. interesting to me. Like if they needed like Mike Purcell is still out there. I think he has three and a half career sacks. Like in the past, like he would be if they needed that run fit guy. Like if they didn't go get yeah. Dean Lowry, yeah, Al would be Watts. perfect if they you yeah. know, didn't have Braden Fahoko and they didn't have Dean Lowry. Like hey, sure, I'd bring back Al Woods, but like I just there's no need for it. Yeah, Brian yeah, Moan is at least like a younger player that like like if they yeah. hadn't signed Lowry, I'd be like yeah, go get Brian Moan right now. But I just I don't know what more he's going to bring to the table that he hasn't that, that they don't already have. And again, what three sacks, something like that, his career. Three, yeah. Three and a half. Yeah. yeah. Um, Matt, uh, very interesting question here. We're really trying to see how far we can expand Peyton Wilson's role on this football team. Cause Matt said, could Peyton Wilson play strong safety? No. Short answer. No, no, like, no, not even close. Um, never. I mean, there'd be 15 guys you tried strong safety before you got to Peyton Wilson, maybe 20. Um, but I do think that Peyton Wilson can, as a linebacker, do some jobs that have fallen to strong safeties in the past. Like, you know, one of Terrell Edmonds' big roles was a tight end eraser in coverage. Yeah. Now, Peyton Wilson hasn't necessarily done a lot of that on tape. But I think he looks like a guy that could do a good bit of that, especially, you know, okay, maybe not the Travis Kelseys of the world, but especially 
with bigger body tight ends, guys that are going to mostly play in line instead of flexed out. Um, I think he can handle those guys even running down the field, dump down the seam like that. That's something that I look at him and say he could do that. And that has been at times part of a strong safety's job, but like covering a half a field, never in a million years. No. Um, yeah, you know, that's just not his, his game. He's not, you know, he maybe fast, but he's not that. I, I think the way that you answered that was the same reason the question was asked, though, because of what he can do from like an in the box perspective of a strong safety assignments. And like you said, covering a tight end, potentially, of course, we necessarily we haven't necessarily seen him do that. But even like, uh, like QB spy stuff like Peyton Wilson can definitely do a lot of things. Um, but you're right. Like if you're asking you know, him to, <laughs> uh, it's kind of funny to even picture it now, like a, a two deep safety or something like that. And Peyton Wilson being yeah, the, one of those two guys, 15 yards off the ball in a half field. <laughs> like, no, no, it's not happening. Like, yeah. uh, and you have to be able to do those things to play strong safety in the NFL. Like you can't just be, a, he's not even like a, you know, Mark Barron, Jeremy chin mm. kind of, like yeah. he's fast, but he's not that kind of athlete. Like again, I think this is a player where, like, in terms of man-to-man coverage, speed the 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 combine speed is not everything. And and while he did have a very fast, all right, welcome boys and girls. Sp- oh you know, Jesus, episode. sorry, I have no idea what that was. <laughs> um. <laughs> I'm trying to look up his 40 time here and I'm getting uh autoplay videos from our lovely mm-hmm. uh uh video player. Yeah, like I think just like Darnell Washington, he's a guy where like just because you see the speed on the stopwatch doesn't mean that's necessarily what you're getting in terms of man-to-man coverage against an NFL receiver. Like it's a very very different job that requires different skills beyond just the speed. And so even if he's as fast or faster than some guys that have played the safety position, um, no, he, he doesn't have the tools to do that. Yeah. I mean, the height, 91, 91st percentile, 10-yard uh, split, 88th percentile, 40-yard dash, 97th percentile. Other than that, I mean, vertical jump, broad jump, pretty average. Arm length and hand size, well below average, 6th percentile and 8th percentile, respectively there. Uh, 26th percentile weight, 29th percentile wingspan. Uh, most common player, Jermaine Pratt, Cincinnati Bengals, who we should be relatively familiar with. I am intrigued by, I mean, we've talked about the coverage upside that's potentially there, but like you said, like you got to see it happen right before you can just say that he's definitely going to be able to do it. I mean, North Carolina used him more as an edge rusher. So like Mm -hmm. if, you know, like that's going the other direction. Like I, I don't, I just don't think like. Yeah, the the flat ground speed might be there, but just the the athleticism in terms of the kind of athletes you got to cover out there and space and the explosiveness that you need, uh, probably just not not something they would ever really. Um, he's not that kind of player. He's a linebacker. Like the it, the, the couple things that like I did, and I actually have this the a post out about this from back in February because when I was watching Peyton Wilson on tape, some of the things that he would do in coverage, obviously like doing like drop spot stuff or like covering flats and stuff, you could st- definitely like see moments of him doing that. But like we're talking about carrying tight ends up seams and stuff like that. So I mean, it just it has. I mean, got to cover wide receivers a lot. Yeah. Like oh yes, yeah. going back time. to the question, yes, yeah, yeah I was yeah. just thinking about the, yeah. yeah. Yeah, like I, right, I, I'll be honest. Like I, I think the Steelers are making a pretty bold move with him if they're going to make him the dime linebacker as a rookie, because there's not a lot of that job on his tape. Like there really isn't. Like, they, like I think the athleticism lines up, but it's stuff that he hasn't really done before. And so uh, I, I think the player, I have a lot of faith in the person. I, I think he's a guy that can. Uh, utilize his intelligence and and his work ethic and his dedication to get there. But I mean, I think this is already a pretty aggressive posting if he's going to be the dime linebacker this year. Yeah, absolutely. Despite the fact that it's like you said, some that's like seven snaps sometimes a game. Yeah, but certainly. Yeah. Um, and then last question that we got here, Lord Megatron's op. Although this person is always in 
the comments when I'm asking for questions. So certainly not an op of Steelers afternoon drive. Um, wants to know what is the bar for the Steelers offense to be considered better or in quotes productive this season? Uh, I mean, better is easy. Score more points, right? I mean, it, that's the, like, that's a, a cop out answer, but it's the right one. I mean, the Steelers finished, 28th in scoring last year they scored 304 points mm -hmm. if you want to be an average offense you probably got to be around somewhere between 350 and 400 like i think that's probably where they need to be they got to find a way to score 50 more points or 60 more points than they did last year um to be average or above average anyway uh, I, I think that's a pretty good place now i you know you can talk about the the component parts like how you know how how can it get better um, right. but I mean, look, if the Steelers don't get better offensive line play this year, then I think a lot of the things they did this off season are going to look really bad. Um, so that, that, that's probably one of them. Quarterback play is probably more questionable. Uh, but you know, I, I they got to find a way to score more points. Uh, they, they did a nice job of not turning the ball over last year. They had mm -hmm. the, uh, I believe it was the second lowest, uh, percentage of their drives ending in a turnover. Uh, so, you know, keep that low and score more points. I mean, that that's basically the bottom line. Um, there's a lot of ways to get there, and I don't know that it really matters which way they go, but uh, I think that's it. I don't know. Is there something you, you have in mind there? Well, I was going to say, obviously, like, with, with what you're saying, the results, the answer is easy, but, like, the process of, of getting to those results is what we're hoping changes because – Last year, obviously, every, I think anybody's going to say that this is an improvement regardless, right? Like, imagine if they are somehow worse. Don't see a world where that happens. But, like, the bar is very low for an improvement upon last year. Uh, but the one thing that they have been able to do relatively successfully over the last couple seasons and even gotten better as the year goes on is running the football. Their rushing EPA has been, in, you know, in the top 10 over the last two seasons. So now you're talking about this year with Arthur Smith, something that he did very well, but in a very different way. I'm curious to see how those two things blend together. Obviously, like he's going to want to bring his concepts, but the Steelers have been good at doing things in a different way on the ground over the last few seasons that kind of differ from what Arthur Smith does. So to me, my biggest questions are just about the marriages of two things that have been successful in the past. I mean, if this team isn't going to be able to run the football, I don't think anything else matters. Like we're talking about the, the quarterback play and stuff like that, although the offensive line certainly is going to play a large role in them being able to run the football. And that's kind of the identity that I think of them as like, I, I look across this line and while I'm, I'm saying there's certainly good pass protectors in there as well. These are all guys to me that seem to fit the identity of wanting to run the football first and foremost. Yeah. Uh, I guess if, if, if like it doesn't go according to plan, but it still works, does it matter? Yeah. You know, I guess that's, in, that's an interesting question. Yeah. Really... It, what if they are like a bottom five rushing offense, but like a top five passing off, like we just don't even see it coming. And somehow that's the world we get to. Yeah, or like maybe they just don't run the ball very well at all, but are able to, you know, like, like maybe they just, you know, are very efficient and then therefore score a lot of points, but they're not actually good. You know, like, mm. you know, you, you can, like, like last year, the Steelers turned points into wins at like an absurd rate, right? I mean, they were 28th in scoring. And they were a playoff team. Like that's that should not be the way it works, right? So you can take that a step forward, further, right? So the Steelers were 25th in yards, and they were 28th in scoring. So they mm -hmm. they were they were they were turning points into wins at a very high rate, but yards into win into points at a slightly below average rate. Well. I mean, you could go the other way. They could finish 25th in yards again, but somehow be like 15th in scoring, right? You could just maximize every third down, every red zone opportunity, and like find a way to kind of luck into a better offense than they actually look like they have. That would probably be a place where like this would be a hard question to answer, right? Is this really success 
or not, because they are getting to that point where I talked about where they're scoring between 350 and 400 points, but the underlying numbers, you have the success rate, the EPA per play are going to tell you that this is probably an offense that shouldn't do that on a regular basis. Very similar to what they did in 2020. Um, and so, yeah, that's probably like a, a weird case that's, that's possible. Uh, I don't, I don't, yeah, but I think if they, if they, if they score more points, 50 to 60 more points, that's probably a pretty good place for them as an offense to be as a goal. So like, it's interesting because I'm going through here, just trying to like line up just in terms of like efficiency, the 49ers last year ran the sixth fewest offensive plays, but were the number one scoring offense. Meanwhile, like two of the top five scoring offenses in the lions and Cowboys were, in, were two and three in terms of plays ran dolphins were about middle of the pack, obviously a very high scoring offense too. So yeah, I mean, it's just at the end of the day, as long as they get the result, I don't think people are going to question it. Um, but the, the path that to me is the likeliest to getting there is just continuing to have success on the ground the way that they have in the last two years and also add in the big plays in the pass game through the play action game. Yeah, I mean, I think that's that's probably the most likely thing that happens. Yeah, um, I think that was all in terms of questions. Did you have anything else? Uh, you had a question. I guess somebody DM'd you this one about uh, oh, yeah, Robert yeah. Jones. Yeah, so this is based off a, a conversation or an article that Mark Caboli had written and they took this and were putting it out there as if it was gospel. People kind of ran with this article. Um, Broderick Jones, Mark Caboli said that he expected Broderick Jones to enter training camp as the team starting left tackle. And then Dan Moore Jr. And uh, Troy Fatano compete on the right side. This person took this as like, this is exactly what is happening. This is gospel. Even in the, the message, they actually said, Omar Khan, I said it on 93.7 The Fan. That was not the case. Um, but we've talked about this in the past. Like, Dan Moore Jr. on the right side isn't happening. It's never happened. Why would it happen now with one year remaining on his contract uh, when he is not going to be, like, if he's not going to be a starter on the left side, he's not going to start for this football team. Yeah, I mean, Pat Meyer basically said as much that, like, you know, young players de learn to develop flexibility when they're young, and that you know, by the time you get set in your ways, then it's too late. Like, and that's why they don't want to and aren't going to try Dan Moore at right tackle. I would be extremely surprised if we see Dan Moore at right tackle for more than, you know, a handful of snaps this training camp. Uh, I expect him to be on the left side. I expect him to, I'll be honest. I don't know who is going to come out with the ones the first week. That's going to be something very interesting to see. It would not surprise me if Dan Moore comes out with the ones the first week at left tackle and the Broderick Jones does not. It, it would not surprise me. Um, I don't know what's going to happen, but I, I that that wouldn't shock me. I do think that Troy Fautanu – and, and the other thing is, I don't know, people have it in their head that like, oh, Dan Moore can't be the backup because he can't swing. It it doesn't matter. They're, they want Broderick Jones to be able to play both. Broderick Jones probably split his reps 50-50 throughout OTAs and minicamp. I expect that he's probably going to do that again at the start of OTAs, where it might be the first time we go out there, it's Dan Moore at left tackle and Broderick Jones at right tackle. And then the next time we go out there, it's Broderick Jones at left tackle and Troy Fautano at right tackle. And the next time they go out there, it'll be Dan Moore at left tackle and Troy Fautano at right tackle. I think they're going to mix and match those guys. I, and so – who goes out with the first team first? I don't really know if it even matters that much, but I expect you're going to see Broderick Jones play both sides, and I think you'll see Dan Moore play left tackle. I do think you may see Fatanu play both sides, but probably primarily right tackle. And I think if there's a battle there, the battle is between Moore and Jones to be the starting left tackle. And then if that winner happens to be Moore, then you would have a sort of secondary battle between the two guys, the two first round picks at right tackle. I'm not sure I'm putting money on that, but like that's the the way that would work for me. Is the, Moore can only play left? Is only going to play left? They're not going to, with one year left in his Steelers tenure, bother to spend time with him at right tackle, and they don't have any reason to need to. This is a, a separate question, but and he hasn't spent a lot of time there. Obviously, I don't know if he how much how many reps you've actually seen him take at right tackle. But if you have, when Dan Moore has played right tackle, does it look as awkward as like he's making it sound, or like is it just he doesn't feel comfortable? But like watching it, you don't necessarily 
notice it's awkward for him? It's not good. I mean, okay. I don't, I don't want to be mean to Dan, but I'll, I mean, I think he would tell you it's not very good. Like it's, it's not, I mean, good. yeah, him, I think it's an admission <laughs> yeah. of his own yeah. that it's not. So like, like yeah. I just, I, you know, I did. And let's be like perfectly honest. Like Dan is not great where he is comfortable. Like, you know, yeah. if, if you, yeah. you know, if, if you've got your, uh, you, you got your, 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 uh, assembly line at, at, uh, at the car factory and, and you've got one guy who's like, white knuckle in it barely getting by doing what he's doing you're not gonna say okay jim it's time to move you somewhere else and see what you can do over here like that's that's not what you're gonna do like it's you know that that's not gonna work for everybody more they've spent their first round draft pick in each of the last two seasons trying to make sure they don't have to play dan Moore. like that's the the yeah the factual truth of it that like they're not gonna you know if you have someone who's already kind of barely getting by you're not going to put him somewhere where he's going to struggle more like that that doesn't make any sense so yeah i i really don't think you're going to see any of dan Moore on the right side he has done it like the last week of training camp like two or three practices the last couple of years just in case like two guys get hurt in game and you you got to figure something out right like you, you it, it's helpful to have done it like no they're never going to do it because they want to do it but that you know to have said okay i've done it a couple times just in case you get into a situation where you have to do it is a little bit better but um it's pretty rare that you get into a situation where you have to play a guy at a specific tackle spot usually you can figure it out would in a situation pretty much worst case scenario for the steelers would dylan cook play on the right side before dan moore Oh yeah, Dylan Cook's been on the right all spring. They've been really working him over there to try to get him ready. I think they are kind of grooming him to be that next swing tackle. It would not surprise me if the tackles in 2025 are Jones on the left, Fatanu on the right, and and Dylan Cook as the swing tackle. Like it seems like they are grooming him for that job. And then maybe you grab some sort of veteran guy just in case, you know. Um, but I yeah. I, Dylan Cook can play right tackle. I I think they have a a, a player in Dylan Cook. I, I I really do. Um, we'll see how it goes, but yeah, I think he can do that. And Spencer Anderson can play right tackle too, if it really comes down to it. Yeah. So so would he? You think he would also play right tackle before Dan Moore? Like if you yes. start seeing bodies go down. Okay. Yes. So he's like the the fifth right tackle. Maybe. I'm not. I'm not sure. I'm <laughs> done listing people that would play right tackle. Before. As I said, that's why I threw in the maybe. He he might be the fifth right tackle on this team, but people are running with this notion that he's competing for the right tackle job along with Troy Fatano and Camp. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I don't think there's any chance of Dan Moore playing right tackle. He's compete it's a three way competition for two spots, but it will be probably more on the left and probably Fatano on the right, and then Jones. You know, if he can beat more on the left, and if not, maybe on the right. You know, I think that's the kind of way you, you set it up. Yeah. Okay. Good stuff. Let us know what you think about that in the comments, of course. Everything that we talked about in the comments. Alan, tell the people they can find you. We're done already? Man, that was fast. Yeah, 3253. Just popped up. At A Saunders underscore PGH on Twitter. PGH Steelers now. SteelersNow.com. Uh, saw some people using the promo code there, so keep that up. Allen 10, get $10 off for uh, all the uh, premium Steelers and Now stuff. That's the best stuff for me and a lot of Derek Bell's stuff. So if you like DB, and I know that the YouTube channel here, <laughs> the comments, love them some DB. Uh, and also, let's tease, DB has a very special guest coming up on his YouTube channel. We're going to have that uh, as well coming up, so we're excited about that as well. Um, yeah, go check it out. And it is not me, but I will be over there probably in the very near future. But somebody uh, else, it's not me. There you go. There you go. Uh, like, subscribe, hit that notification bell, hit us in the comments. Leave us a five-star review and subscribe if you were listening somewhere else that is not on YouTube, Apple, Spotify, wherever your podcast from. Just search Steelers Afternoon Drive and do that for us over there as well. Follow us on TikTok, trying to grow that up as well. Steelers Afternoon Drive, of course, that is where you can find us on everything. Uh, for Zachary Smith, PGH, and Alan Saunders, thanks for jumping in. Take another ride on the Steelers Afternoon Drive. <laughs>